<clears throat> Today we come to our final study in the uh, in the book of Job. This final lesson is an interesting one in that it speaks about the difference between first-hand knowledge and second-hand information. And with our modern technology, we're, we're able to experience the whole world, at least second-handed, uh, through TV, our movies, books, newspaper, FaceTime, photography. Uh, <clears throat> but there's nothing quite, uh, quite equal to first-hand experience. I had seen lots of pictures of the Grand Canyon but actually standing on the edge of that Grand Canyon and looking at it, it's really different from just looking at someone's pictures of the Grand Canyon or looking down from an airplane to see the earth below. Uh, it, it's quite a different experience if you have never uh, had that opportunity. Or a lively ball game or a great worship service in church or face-to-face -face, uh, coffee and cookies with a friend compared to, to Zoom, for example. <laughs> and uh, we realize that there's a lot of difference between first-hand knowledge and uh, second-hand hearsay. Now, up until, <clears throat> up until now, uh, the encounter between Job and his friends has been uh, primarily dealing with, uh, with second-hand knowledge. As we come to the end of this magnificent written record of our problem with suffering without knowing the cause, we hear Job exclaim, wow, what a difference between what I had been led to believe about God and the personal encounter with his majesty, his power, and his grace. Remember, we were, we were introduced to Job uh, as a man who pleased God. Uh, nothing of his suffering was for his sin. Uh, his problems were not divine judgment against him at all. Uh, quite to the contrary, his suffering was precisely because of his faithfulness and his constant fulfillment of what he believed to be uh, his duties. Uh, Satan is then given an opportunity to test Job's confidence in God. Uh, he takes away his possessions. He takes away his children. Uh, he allows a terrible sickness to come on Job. He even loses the confidence of his wife. Uh, then we're, then, then we, we meet his three friends, or his four friends, actually. Uh, they were, we'll call them so-called friends. They were the first to show comfort and, and, and sympathy. And they, they did it in, in the very beginning. But they quickly decided that uh, Job's difficulties were God's judgment for sin. Uh, that was their secondhand knowledge. Uh, they were convinced that all suffering and all human disasters uh, in life were the result of doing uh, something wrong, either known or, or unknown. Uh, the first three we know as Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they were quite adamant in saying that all human suffering is because of sin. Uh, their, their comfort <laughs> uh, simply added to Job's confusion and his anxiety as, as he tried to understand what was happening in his life. The young man Elihu at least moved a little closer to an understanding of human adversity. He said that humans must trust God's wisdom in spite of adversities, uh, and we need not try to vindicate ourselves before the majesty and the mystery of God. He indicated that uh, sometimes suffering may be to correct or to instruct us. Uh, at, at the end, God shows up to test Job as well as to vindicate him and to correct the thinking of his friends. As we come to the end of our study, 
uh, we see uh, we'll see three very short speeches here at the end. We'll see Job's speech of humility. Uh, we'll see God's final word <laughs> to Job's friends. And then we'll have a final word from the scribe who was inspired to write this magnificent book. Uh, our final scripture lesson will be taken from chapter 42, the first 11 verses of the chapter 42. And our passage, uh, our first passage is from uh, uh, chapter of that chapter, of course. Uh, uh, it is Job's final response to, uh, to his friends from, from chapter 42. And I'll, I'll read those verses, verses 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, Who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words and am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. <laughs> These are uh, Job's final words here. We see here some powerful concepts, really, that Job had learned through this uh, total ordeal. Uh, we'll run through some of those. God can do whatever he desires to do, whatever he decides to do. Uh, that God can and will do. Uh, nothing in the universe, nothing in the universe can change the direction of God's plans. Uh, we're often asked, uh, or we're often asking, better said, uh, our questions in ignorance of God's purpose or of God's plan. Uh, Job confesses here that uh, he tried to find answers, but with a very limited understanding of what God does. He finally confess confesses that he had never seriously considered uh, God as the one who operates the entire universe in all of its intricate details. Uh, Job then is going to confess that uh, his total ignorance uh, before God appeared to him now with his power and in majesty. Job, Job is, is humiliated totally in the very presence of, uh, of God. And uh, then Job remembers when God first spoke to him in that first meeting, uh, making demands of uh, Job's, what is your great knowledge and what is your great power? In a word, God was asking Job, do you think you could operate the world better than I do? Uh, it's here that Job really melts down. Uh, he admits that when God began to show himself, uh, that Job began to understand his lack of knowledge and uh, about everything. Uh, it is, it's here also that Job saw the difference between human wisdom and the wisdom of God. Uh, everything before had been learned from others. It was all secondhand knowledge. Uh, it, it was hearsay knowledge. Suddenly now, in the presence of God, Job is confronted with the very power and majesty of God, and that changes everything. Uh, that's, <laughs> I'm sure that's true for all of us. Uh, Job, after experiencing the very presence of God, takes back everything he's ever said. He says, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said it. Oh, how sorry I am that I ever questioned your judgments. And finally, Job recognized, uh, at least to some degree, the difference between human ignorance and God's wisdom. Uh, and this left him, he says, as dust and ashes before the greatness of God. Now, uh, after Job's humility before God, uh, the Lord's going to turn to Job's friends uh, after their complicated and high-sounding speeches about what they knew about God 
they're about to be devastated by divine anger. Uh, our next passage is a short speech by God in which he orders Job's friends to permit Job to be an intercessor priest on their behalf. And this was long before there was an Aaronic priesthood, long before Aaron and his family were established as the priest. And uh, that little short speech is uh, uh, verses 7 through 9. I'll, I'll read that from chapter 42. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends. For you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. For you have not spoken truth about me, as my servant Job has. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namanite, went and did as the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Now, here we see quite an, a, a turn of events. God turns to Job's friends without much courtesy. He says, I'm angry with you. So you, you misinterpreted me to Job. Uh, he immediately accuses Eliphaz and his two friends of speaking untruths about, about God. What they said uh, about Job was also untrue. And what they had said about God was <laughs> totally untrue. So uh, we, we find here that God accuses them of, of totally misinterpreting both Job's problems and their understanding of how God operates. First of all, Job's difficulties were not caused by his sin. Uh, and all of them had claimed that, uh, that that was the basis of his difficulty. In the second place, they certainly did not know the mind, the mind of God concerning Job, nor his difficulty. We, we, we find that out. We find that out because we, we are privy to what is taking place in the councils of heaven. They did not know that, of course. In the third place, Job had spoken the truth in that his suffering could not be because he disrespected or sinned against God on purpose or, or even ignorantly. Now, interestingly, God demands from them a rather hefty sacrifice. They're to take 14 animals to Job. And Job is to act as a priest, a priest before God on their behalf. Uh, the three of them had possibly seen something of God's majesty and wonder throughout this episode. We, uh, we, we do not know uh, to what degree they had, they had seen the, the wonder and the majesty of God. Uh, but whatever happened, they responded without a question. Uh, they, and of course, they had no say in how it was to be done. God gave the orders. And so Job, having made the, having made the sacrifice, Job interceded uh, for their forgiveness uh, or for their ignorance, how, however we want to, to name it, because uh, Job, Job interceded for them uh, along with their sacrifice, and God accepted Job's plea on their behalf. Uh, this is a, interesting. This is an early picture of how pardon will come through a sacrifice and a mediator between God and sinful man. It's uh, quite, a, quite an interesting little snapshot there uh, of, uh, of the need for a sacrifice for sin and a need for a mediator between uh, sinful man and holy God. 
Our, our final passage uh, of our study uh, here in, in the book of Job comes from our scribe, uh, the one who was inspired to write this book by the Spirit of God. As our book began with the inspired scribe, setting up the scenario in which we see Job as a just and godly man, he will now at the end be proclaiming total justification of Job's uprightness. He's totally vindicated by God's uh, word as well as uh, rewards and blessings in the end. And the last verses we have for today is from chapter 42, verses 10 and 11. Uh, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. All his brothers and sisters and former acquaintances came to him and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all of the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Interesting that even here, our, our scribe does not say that any one of them had any understanding of what was going on uh, in the councils of heaven. Uh, after Job had uh, fulfilled his priestly duties, uh, his fortune was restored. He was, he was doubly blessed. He had obviously forgiven all those who had forsaken him during his ordeal. Uh, and now they all returned, and, but interestingly, not empty-handed. They all brought him a gift of silver or gold. Uh, continuing to the very end of this final chapter, we see that Job's family uh, was increased again, as did his animal holdings. They were increased again. And he saw his grandchildren up to the fourth generation. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, neither Job nor his friends ever find out the real reason behind the suffering of a just person. This secret is kept in heaven until it is revealed to us at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the first one to ever explain to us uh, the fact of our, our spiritual enemy, whom we know as Satan or the devil. Now, others knew about him, but they knew, knew uh, nothing about his character nor, nor, nor much about his activities until Jesus began to explain those things to us and, and also to the, to the apostles. But uh, as we come to the end, we have, we have lots of great lessons, really. Uh, as we finish up our study of Job, I'll, uh, I'll run over some of those. Uh, perhaps the greatest is that we should be willing to admit uh, that we can really be wrong uh, when that is the case, when we are really wrong. We need to learn to admit that we do not know all we need to know before making judgments. Uh, number two, we certainly see that we are totally dependent on God for life's blessings. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, clearly, <laughs> clearly stated throughout all the scriptures that we, that we are totally dependent upon God for life's blessings. Uh, number three, we should, on occasion, take seriously the role of priest to intercede for someone else in prayer. I think this is a great model for us to follow. Uh, we, we can pray for others. We can intercede uh, for others. Uh, and also, we see here also that God's promises are kept and not always according to, to our timetable, but uh, God keeps his promises. And he, he declared that uh, over and over through, the, through this whole story. Uh, we may never know why some things happen to us. And we, we need to recognize that. that there, there may be things that happen to us that we will never, ever understand. Uh, though Job never knew, 
we knew and know that we have an enemy in the spirit world and that his intention is to, as he did with Job, to try to make us question God and maybe even blame him for the antics of the devil. And last, perhaps the greatest lesson of all, is that God is running the universe. But at the same time, he takes personal interest in each one of us. He knows my name. <laughs>